It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ken Ip, who's going to talk to us today about cysts. Okay, so today we'll be going through an overview about the definitions and diagnostic approach to different cutaneous cysts we may encounter. And this corresponds to chapter 110 in Bologna's textbook. How does this work? Now, cysts are discrete dermal or subcutaneous, usually papule nodules, usually fluid filled. And strictly speaking, they have an epithelial lining to be considered a true cyst. By comparison, a pseudocyst is a similar cystic structure, but one that lacks an epithelial lining. Now, when we start talking about definitions, or when we start talking about cysts, one of the most commonly erroneously used term is a sebaceous cyst used by many non-dermatologists. But strictly speaking, only steatocytomas are of sebaceous origin. So the term sebaceous cyst is best avoided because most commonly they're used to apply to epidermoid cysts or pilus cysts where the moist keratin content, the soft cheese-like content, is mistaken for or mistaken as being of sebaceous origin. When we think about cysts, we can first categorize them as to their uh, or origin. So those that are of follicular, follicular origin, those deriving from the infundibulum, include epidermoid cysts, milium, which are essentially smaller epidermoid cysts, villus hair cysts, and pigmented follicular cysts. Those derived from the outer roof sheath are trichelemal cysts, and as I said before, those derived from the sebaceous duct, and in fact, the only cysts deriving from the sebaceous um, units are the steatocytomas. And then we have those cysts that are derived from sweat glands, including eccrine glands, those are the eccrine hydrocystomas, and the apocrine glands, and those are the apocrine hydrocystoma. So this lays out the framework that we're going to go through this morning. A more useful diagnostic approach would also be considering the histopathological characteristics of each cyst as well. So those derived from the follicular units have a stratified squamous epithelium, whereas those derived from the sweat glands have non-stratified squamous epithelium. And we'll dive into the details soon. Now to start with epidermoid cysts, they are the most common cutaneous cysts, and as I said, derived from the follicular infundibulum. Hence, sometimes they're also referred to as infundibular cysts. They can occur primarily, or they can be secondary to disrupted follicular structure or when the epithelium is traumatically implanted. And so they're also known as epidermal inclusion cysts. And there was a scenario where you can see that would be in patients with acne vulgaris. And when you encounter a patient with multiple or lots of epidermoid cysts, more than you'd expect or at a younger age than you'd expect, you should consider the back of your mind whether or not there's an underlying cause such as Gardner's syndrome. So inquire about whether there's family history of colon polyps or even medications such as BRAF inhibitors. So clinically, epidermoid cysts appear as well-demarcated dermal nodules ranging from a few millimeters to several centimeters. They usually have a visible punctum illustrated in the center of these pictures, and that represents the infundibulum uh, of the follicle where the cyst was derived. If you were to squeeze them like you did at the title page, you usually get a malodorous cheese-like contents, and again, these are hydrated white keratinized contents rather than the sebaceous contents, which often lead people to mistakenly um, refer to these as sebaceous cysts. And you can further divide these into cold and hot cysts. So cold are the non-inflamed, largely asymptomatic cysts, whereas hot are the inflamed ones, usually partially ruptured, generating a intense inflammatory or granulomatous response. And then down the bottom right here, that's an example of some of Gardner syndrome with multiple of these epidermoid cysts. Now, epidermoid cysts can also occur in the anal genital regions, more commonly in the scrotum than the vulva. And these can lead to dystrophic calcification, which can be quite um, disfiguring for patients, as illustrated here. 
In terms of histology, the classic infundibula or epidermoid cyst has a stratified squamous epithelium. And the most important feature of the stratified squamous epithelium is that it has retention of the granular layer, which you can see in the bottom right here. So it's a well circumscribed cyst because it's lined by epithelium. The epithelium is stratified squamous epithelium with retention of the granular layer. And then within it is just laminated keratin, which we see here. And then and depending on the cut, you often see a connection to the overlying epidermis as well. Milia or milia, if they were multiple, are common across all age groups. And in fact, around half of infants when they're born have milia, which resolve in the course of four to five weeks. They can also occur secondarily from blistering processes such as in porphyria cutaneitata or epidermolysis bullosa acquisita. Now, most of these are derived from follicular infundibulum, and so histologically, they actually look the same as an epidermoid cyst, except they're clinically much smaller. But some can also be derived from salivary glands as well, which we see in infants, and in these settings, they're known as Epstein pearls and bond nodules. So the photo on the left here illustrates multiple sort of pinpoint millimeter skin colored papules, which are the classic millium. And in here in the heart palette is an example of a millium derived from the salivary gland. So that's an Epstein's pearl. And then down the bottom right here, we see um, post-inflammatory scarring from a patient with epidermolysis below the acquisitor with multiple millium as a result. Millia, sorry. Um, milia can also, or milia can also occur in cluster on an inflammatory plaque, and we call that milia on plaque. And the most common locations for these are preauricular or periauricular, sorry, and periorbital. And these are associated with a number of conditions, including pseudoxanthoma elasticum, discoid lupus, lichen planus, as well as drugs such as cyclosporin. And you can see here in the histology, it looks very much like a epidermoid cyst, well circumscribed um, cyst in the dermis. If you were to zoom in, it will be stratified squamous epithelium with retention of the granular layer, granular layer, and in the cyst contents is just laminated keratin. Um, when we see milia in infants, at the back of our minds, we should also be thinking of whether or not they could have rare syndrome. So. One that's associated with multiple milia is orofacial digital syndrome type 1, which is a X-linked disorder associated with multiple orofacial and digital anomalies. Um, and the spectrum of these findings are illustrated on the right here. We have a broad nasal bridge, tongue polyps, um, finger anomalies, sparse hair, and also multiple milia will be seen. Um, these are also associated with renal cysts, intellectual disability, and brain malformations and hearing loss, but it is rather rare, um, but just worth a mention. Now, another important um, cyst derived from the follicular unit with a stratified squamous epithelium, uh, velous hair cysts. These are uh, generally derived from the occlusion of the follicular infundibulum followed by cystic dilatation and secondary atrophy of the hair bulb. The majority of these are sporadic, although hereditary forms can be seen, and most not commonly in those with eruptive villus hair cysts, and that's associated with a keratin-17 mutation. And clinically, there appears multiple skin color to slightly blue-brown um, dome-shaped papules, typically across hair-bearing areas and the trunk. Histologically, again, we have a stratified squamous epithelium with retention of the granular layer. Um, within the cyst itself, we have laminated keratin, but with the, with the addition of multiple these villus hairs, hence the name villus hair cysts. And pigmented follicular hair cysts are very much similar also presents as pigmented papules or nodules with a predilection for the head, neck, and chest, usually solitary compared to villus hair cysts. And the histology, again, we have a stratified squamous epithelium 
retention of the granular layer, and then within the cyst, instead of villus hair, we have multiple, multiple pigmented hairs, hence the name pigmented follicular hair cysts. And on the top right here, these pictures are taken from a case report from CED. Um, initially a, well, dark brown nodule at the border, which when they evacuated it, review a coil of terminal hair. Trichalemal cysts are probably the second most common cyst behind infundibular or epidermoid cysts, but they are four to five times less common than those. They derive from the outer root sheath, and another term for these trichalemal cysts is isthmus catagen cysts. They can also be spelt with an I instead of O, depending on which text you read. They usually occur on the scalp, and compared to epidermoid cysts, they usually do not have a visible punctum on the surface. Because the, the lining of trichalemal cysts tends to be thicker than epidermoid cysts, um, when we try to remove these, they're also more easily enucleated compared to epidermoid cysts. In terms of histology, again, we have a cystic structure within the dermis. We don't see an overlying connection to the epidermis. We have a stratified squamous epithelium, but if we look on the right here, the distinguishing feature compared to epidermoid cysts and that there's no granular layer in the cyst wall. Within the cyst itself, again, we have compact keratin, sometimes can, which can be calcified as we see on the left. So that's a distinguishing feature, the absence of the granular layer. And then we'll actually go for an algorithm later on that helps us um, summarize these again. Steatocytomas, they are derived from the sebaceous ducts, and as I said before, are the only true sebaceous cysts, and hence why we should avoid that term. They can occur in isolation, termed steatocytoma simplex, or they can occur in a cluster with multiple forming, and that's known as steatocytoma multiplex. And in this setting, you should consider whether or not there's an underlying hereditary um, mutation, usually in keratin-17, which also accounts for uh, pachynechia congenitor type 2. Now, cytocytoma is related to sebaceous cysts, so as you'd ex expect, onset is usually seen around puberty with a seborrheic distribution, and clinically they appear as soft, firm, semi-translucent papules, as you can see on the illustrations on the right. In terms of histology, Steatocytomas also have a stratified squamous epithelium, but they also have, as either part of the cyst wall or adjacent to it, multiple sebaceous glands. Now, um, the, the cyst contents usually appear as empty, but that's purely because of the form and fixing process, but normally they would contain um, secretions. Um, another important feature of sebaceous steatocytomas, sorry, is that they have this crenulated eosinophilic cuticle um, within the cystic wall. So stratified squamous epithelium, sebaceous glands either adjacent to or within the cyst wall, and then the lining is what we describe as this crunkly crenulated eosinophilic cuticle, usually empty because of the formalin fixing process. Now, dermoid cysts was in the list before, but it's also important to consider as part of this group because they also present as histologically stratified, have a stratified squamous epithelium lining the cyst wall. So dermoid cysts are considered benign chorostomas, which means that they are normal tissue derived from germ cell layers, which are foreign to that body site. The most common dermoid cysts we see are the congenital types, whereby the dermal cells become sequestrated in subcutaneous planes. Um, most of these are congenital and become clinically apparent in infancy or early childhood. And they occur along the embryonic fusion planes. So the most common places we see are the root of nose, which is the fusion plane of the frontal processes, or in the lateral eyebrow. They can also occur pre and post auricular as well. Now, the most important takeaway point when we're dealing with dermoid cysts is to consider neuroimaging via ultrasound or MRI to exclude connection to the underlying um, central nervous system.
And on the left, we see an inconspicuous subcutaneous lump at the lateral eyebrow, which is a typical location for these congenital dermoid cysts, um, which occur at the fusion planes. The nasal root is another common place. And then on the right here is an MRI demonstrating connection of the cyst to the underlying central nervous system. In terms of histology, as I said, dermoid cysts have a stratified squamous epithelium lining the cyst wall, but the uh, distinguishing features are that they're associated with pilosebaceous units. Within the cyst, they have laminated keratin, and they also usually have multiple hair follicles opening into the cyst as well. So compare that to steatocytoma, you would only get um, sebaceous gland associated with it, but the cis contents itself is usually empty and you wouldn't have multiple hair follicles opening into it, which we don't actually see in this um, slide. Now, another important entity to think about when we um, have, when we're faced with a cyst that's been removed and on slides we see stratified squamous epithelium is proliferating epithelial cysts. And these are divided into proliferating epidermoid cysts and proliferating trichelemal cysts. In terms of proliferating epidermoid cysts, the epithelium, rather than being the well circumscribed, which we saw earlier on, um, they actually proliferate peripherally into the surrounding dermis. They have multiple squamous eddies, which are these swirls, sort of onion shaped um, arrangements of maturing squamous epithelium and they are associated with variable degrees of cellularity and atypia. Compare that to proliferating trichelemal cysts, they proliferate centrally rather than peripherally. They lack infiltrative growth into the surrounding dermis, and they also have these broad anastomosing bands and islands of squamous epithelium, and similarly show variable cellular atypia. And this is an example of a proliferating epidermoid cyst. Again, similar features to your normal epidermoid cyst, but on higher power, you can see multiple of these squamous eddies, these swirls of maturing squamous um, cells. And then a proliferating trichelemal cyst, you can see it's much more, um, there's a lot more activity going on compared to a bland normal trichelemal cysts uh, with multiple islands. And then on closer power, the arrows are referring to um, areas of individual atypical squamous cells. Now, one of the larger case series comparing the clinical pathological features of proliferating epithelial cysts um, was published in 1995. What they found was that proliferating epidermal cysts, um, one third occurred in women, compared to 70% occurring in women for proliferating trichelemal cysts. The proliferating epidermal cysts, as you'd expect, epidermal cysts can occur on the scalp, but also other regions such as anal genital as well, whereas the majority of the proliferating trichelemal cysts, as you'd expect of trichelemal cysts, occurred on the scalp. What's important was that these have a significant rate of local recurrence, but none of the proliferating epidermal cysts demonstrated evidence of metastases. So this suggests follow-up would be warranted and a wider excision margin should be considered. Whereas for proliferating trichelemal cysts in the series of 63, a small proportion, well actually only one case had local recurrence and one case had regional lymph node metastases. So that's always important to consider in your examination of these patients. Um, if the histology does present or return as a proliferating trichelemal cyst. And in fact, in literature, there's around 30 cases of proliferating trichelemal cysts, which have demonstrated evidence of regional or distant metastases. Now, this is the algorithm I was talking about, um, taken from Bologna in terms of approach to a cyst with a stratified squamous epithelium. So, the easiest way is to divide those that have a cyst wall with granular layer or those which have abrupt keratinization, and that is to say they don't have uh, granular layer. So we go down the right tracks here first. For if you have a stratified squamous epithelium which doesn't have a granular layer, then automatically you're thinking about either trichelemal cysts, 
if it's discrete with pale staining cells and compact keratin in the middle, whereas if it looks slightly different, has broad anastomosing bands, islands, cellulae, tipia, these horn curls, then you'd be thinking more about the proliferating trichelemal cysts. Going back down the left here, if the granular layer is retained, if it has the eosinophilic um, cuticle, which is that ragged lining we saw, association with sebaceous glands in the cyst wall, then we should be thinking about steatocystoma. If it contains hair, sebaceous lobules, um, different components of the dermis, hair follicles opening into it, then we should be thinking about the congenital dermoid cysts, uh, which usually occur in the lateral eyebrows, nasal roots, in which case you should consider neuroimaging um, to exclude the underlying connection to the central nervous system. Whereas if we move down here, it was um, stratified squamous epithelium, granular layer with laminated keratin, then it's either an epidermal cyst or milium, or if it had multiple villous hair within it, that takes us down to a villous hair cyst, or multiple pigmented hair shafts, that takes us down to a pigmented follicular cyst. But if we were to show features of atypia and squamous eddies, then it would be a proliferating epidermal cyst. So that's just a very um, nicely summarized approach to stratified squamous epithelium lining cysts. Um, and this is just an example. So if we follow that algorithm, we see a cystic structure within the dermis and, oh, sorry, that's an answer. But again, stratified squamous epithelium on higher power, we have retention of the granular layer. There's no none of these squamous eddies, no cellular atypia within this lining. And in the cyst contents is laminated keratin, hence the diagnosis epidermoid cysts. And then for this, another cystic structure um, within the dermis. Uh, and the high power view on the right, we see abrupt keratinization. So we've there's no there's loss of the granular layer. And immediately we're thinking about whether or not this is a trichelemal cyst or a proliferating trichelemal cyst. It doesn't have those keratin pearls, no cellular atypia, no um, anastomosing bands. And so this is just a normal trichelemal cyst. And in fact, down the bottom here, we see partial rupture with a, a um, granulomatous inflammatory response, which is very commonly encountered with these cysts. And uh, we'll just take a small break and watch Dr. Pimple Popper pop the cysts. Now, moving on to cysts that are lined by non-stratified squamous epithelium, the really main one we should know about are hydrocy is hydrocystomas, which appear as translucent skin-colored to blue cysts, usually on the face, either around the eyelids or on the cheeks. And these are derived from the sweat ducts. So apocrine hydrocystomas are derived from apocrine sweat glands, they're usually solitary, and some there's a school of thought that they're actually adenomas of the apocrine sweat gland coils, whereas eccrine hydrocystomas can be solitary but can be multiple as well, and they result from the cystic dilatation of equine ducts from retention of secretions. And the curious things about these are they can grow rapidly, and they tend to be tend to fluctuate in size due to temperature changes. So here we have a solitary apocrine hydrocystoma, typical location, eyelid margin or around the eyelids. And then here again, we have these multiple sort of translucent skin colored, slightly blue hue um, cystic structures. And these are multiple eccrine hydrocystomas. In terms of histology, uh, we have for apocrine hydrocystomas, they tend to be multilobulated. And then if we go high power, they're usually lined by two layers, so they're not a stratified squamous epithelium, with two layers of cuboidal to columnar cells. And then the distinguishing feature for apocrine hydrocystoma compared to eccrine hydrocystoma is the presence of these um, apocrine decapitation secretions. Contrast that to an eccrine hydrocystoma, usually unilobular, again, we only have two layers lining the cyst wall and absence of the uh, the decapitation secretions that we see with a apocrine um, hydrocystoma.
Another quite curious finding with these hydrocystomas is that they often contain sweat inside and these sweat can be pigmented. So I did see one case last year where, where this elderly gentleman with a cyst on the eyelid rapidly grew in the space of weeks. And when we aspirated that cyst, we aspirated essentially brown colored fluid, which is pigmented sweat. And in terms of other um, cysts that, are, that we encounter, which are lined by non-stratified squamous epithelium, these are also detailed in the Bologna chapter as well, but they include essentially um, cysts derived from developmental anomalies of the face and neck. So in the midline or paramedian, we have bronchogenic cysts, which are essentially related to the um, budding of the trachea and respiratory and epithelium. Um, down the midline, if we have a cyst which moves with tongue movements, then that's a thyroglossal duct cyst. Um, the dermoid cysts are highlighted here, use um, the lateral eyebrows or the nasal root. And on lateral view, we can have ear pits. Um, which is anterior to the ear, which usually is not associated with any anomalies, but consider um, hearing loss, which can be very rarely associated with it. And we have bronchial cleft cysts as well, which are remnants of the gills that we have um, in utero. Uh, now, in terms of pseudocysts, um, as I said before, pseudocysts are cysts that are, strictly speaking, not lined by an epithelium. Um, one important entity to point out would be a pseudocyst of the oracle. These are usually a, those structures or cystic structures that can arise in the scaphoid fossa, usually in middle aged men, and could complain of pain or swelling. Um, and that should be, I guess, incorporated into your differential diagnosis for structures you encounter on the ear, including, say, chondrodermatitis nodularis helices, which by contrast would be a painful swelling. And the histology here, we see we have um, degenerative cartilage, a fluid-filled structure in the middle, which is not surrounded by any epithelium, instead by cartilage and degenerative cartilage, and hence the term pseudocyst. Now, having gone through all of that, um, when we deal with cysts, there are a number of management options available. They can be left alone, they can be popped, they can be excised. Uh, the question was asked, is routine pathologic evaluation of what they mean would be the all the cystic structures which people label sebaceous cysts, so including epidermal, trachylemal cysts, and so forth, is it necessary? So a retrospective review, single center, was done. Um, sorry, I can't remember from where. And essentially from over 1,300 samples that were submitted with the label of sebaceous cysts, epidermal, trichelemal cysts, et cetera, they found that 48 of these cases returned with a malignant diagnosis, most commonly squamous cell and basal cell carcinoma. So I guess um, stick with the, with the old adage, which is if you cut anything out, everything should be submitted for histology. In terms of um, newer techniques to deal with sebaceous cysts, I was just went, I just went through a few of the JAD surgical and therapeutic pills. So for hot or inflamed cysts, one management option is intralesional of corticosteroids um, to settle down the inflammation. And one of the problems you can encounter with injecting um, excess amounts of fluids into, say, a sebaceous cyst is that you can pop it, which will stimulate an even more intense inflammatory response. So one novel therapeutic pill in the JAD is that you actually insert two needles into the cystic space of an epidermoid cyst, one for injecting and then one to um, allow an outflow if you were to inject excess amounts so as to reduce the risk of overexpanding and popping the cysts. Various surgical techniques have also been described to allow us to enucleate the cyst and remove it in its entirety. So one option we see illustrated here is what we call the inverted parachute retraction suture. You make an elliptical excision 
um, into the dermis without popping the cysts. Then you put multiple um, loops of dermal sutures over the top. You retract it, which allows you to pull out the cysts carefully whilst um, remove it from the tethered um, surrounding dermis. Yeah. Um, as we see here quite nicely, the whole cyst is removed um, without breaking it. Now, obviously, you can do these large excisions on the, for epidermoids or trichelemal cysts in trunk or non-cosmetically sensitive areas. But for those occurring on the face, obviously, the, the smaller the scar you produce, the better the cosmetic outcome. So here we have a dotted outline of this epidermoid cyst uh, with two options. One is the traditional elliptical excision to get into the cyst to remove it into entirety. The second option is what we call a minimally invasive, minimal incision technique, where you make a small cut into the epidermis and superficial dermis, and then you try to retract, the, um, you make a small cut, you would pop the other cystic contents out, then you pop in some um, sterile forceps to grab the lining and try to remove the entire cyst wall contents to re reduce the rate of recurrence and using this rather than a large elliptical excision produces a much more satisfactory cosmetic outcome. Then the next question goes, can we do it with laser? And yes, we can. So this group um, published a technique using where they made a small hole instead of essentially the same as the minimal incision technique, but instead of using a scalpel, you use a CO2 laser to drill a hole and essentially you perform the same technique to remove um, the cyst contents and the cyst wall. And one paper comparing the outcomes of complete surgical excision using um, minimally invasive excision versus using a CO2 laser. And what they found was that the time taken for the entire procedure was shorter if you were just to use the CO2 laser excision technique and um, the recurrence rates using that technique was slightly higher, 3.3% compared to 8.3%, but the numbers were small. They only did 60 patients each arm, so it didn't amount to statistical significance. But certainly, patients were much more satisfied with the minimal incision technique using the CO2 laser compared to complete surgical excision. Um, and then to finish on, we can also manage some of these cysts medically if um, the patient felt compelled to. And medical management for hydrocystomas would include use of topical antiperspirants. So you can use aluminum chloride or you can use atropine mixed in cream. Uh, tra the traditional percentage for atropine mixed in cream was usually around 1%, and that would be suitable for a patient with multiple ecrine hydrocystomas. Um, but that can also have a number of anticholinergic side effects as well. So one group published a small randomized controlled study comparing a much lower percentage of 0.03% atropine versus 15% aluminum chloride and found both actually were efficacious in reducing the number of ecrine hydrocystomas. Um, the rationale, of course, being that the hydrocystomas are derived from the sweat ducts or the sweat glands. Um, yeah, so that's another option to bear in mind if a patient is desiring um, an intervention, but not but what you don't think surgery is necessarily indicated. And here's just another popping video to finish. And that's the end of the talk. Thank you, Dr. Ken Ip. Ken is a dermatology registrar at Waikato District Health Board. I'm Amanda Oakley, dermatologist, Waikato District Health Board, and chief editor of Dermnet New Zealand.